called Chang Yiyang, the Long River. For thousands of miles, the Yangtze winds its way through the heart of China, past monuments to the world's most enduring civilization. Preserved here are the enigmatic symbols of a culture so old it reaches back 2,000 years before the time of Christ. Today, up to 17 million tourists a year flock to see the treasures of the Yangtze. Some are living museums. Some are thriving spiritual centers, like the temples at Fengdu and Shibujai. Others are lost cities ruined by the passage of time. Yandu was at the height of its power before Columbus arrived in the New World. Already enough artifacts have been recovered to fill several museums. But time is running out. At a site called Three Gorges, the world's most powerful dam, will create a man-made flood that will inundate the Yangtze Valley. China is no stranger to disaster. In August 1998, the worst floods of the century ravaged the countryside of central China. The Chinese army tried to rescue an area the size of New Zealand and failed. 13 million people were displaced from their homes. In this century alone, the Yangtze has claimed over 300,000 lives. Yet the people endure. For as long as they can remember, the floodwaters of the Yangtze have been the lifeblood of China. The Long River begins its journey in the high plateaus of Tibet. Born of ancient glaciers, it plunges over 21,000 feet before cascading into the tributaries of the Yangtze Valley and making its way to the sea. Nearly 4,000 miles long, it ranks third after the Nile and the Amazon. Its drainage area is the size of Mexico. The Chinese hope the Three Gorges Dam will bring a boom to the 400 million people that occupy the Yangtze floodplain. But prosperity comes at a price. Rising water will soon obliterate one of the strangest chapters in Chinese history. Professor Ran Roy Chan crosses a swift flowing tributary north of the river. Each step takes him closer to an archaeological mystery. These are the hanging coffins of the Yangtze, the most bizarre burial site in all of Asia. Some coffins contain the bodies of up to three people, but no one knows for certain who put them there or why. One can only marvel at the skill and resolve of these ancient climbers. How did they move the coffins up there? Even with our modern technology today, it is very difficult. Even monkeys would find it difficult to climb up there. Nobody knows how to solve this mystery. Hoisting coffins up a mountain is not typically Chinese. It could be the work of a little-known culture called the Ba that first settled along the Yangtze over 4,000 years ago. 
This boss sword, made of bronze, carries the image of a tiger, an animal they probably worshipped. Whether its makers had any links with the hanging coffins may never be known. The coming flood will wash away the clues. By the year 2002, rising water behind the dam will entomb some 1,200 known archaeological digs. Another 8,000 unexplored sites, likely filled with priceless artifacts, will also vanish. The flood will not be nature's doing, but man's attempt to control it. In 1994, engineers launched China's most ambitious construction project since the building of the Great Wall of China 2,500 years ago. When completed, the Three Gorges Dam will be the world's largest producer of hydroelectric power and the costliest at 20 times the total annual budget of the United Nations. In concrete alone, the dam will consume 26 million tons, enough to build 44 of Egypt's Great Pyramids. The project is designed to control flooding on the lowlands downriver and provide enough non-polluting energy to propel China into the 21st century. While the dam holds out the promise of a new future, its construction threatens one of the world's richest deposits of ancient history. The dam will form a reservoir the length of Lake Superior. By 2002, the low-lying areas of the river valley will be submerged along with hundreds of archaeological sites. In 2004, when the dam is nearly completed, the water level will rise to 500 feet. 13 cities, 140 towns, and more than 1,300 villages will be engulfed. By 2009, the surface will rise to its full height of 577 feet, creating the largest artificial body of water on Earth. A casualty of China's progress is the Yangtze's fabled Three Gorges. As the river slowly rises some 70 stories high, their splendor will diminish with every foot. Tourists from around the world arrive daily to relish one of nature's great spectacles before it's lost. Riverboat Captain Tan has worked on the Yangtze since he was 11. Now 65 years old, he is skipper of the White Swan, which carries wealthy passengers through the gorges. After half a century spent on the river, Captain Tan is about to retire. This will be his final voyage through the gorges as he has known them. It takes a lifetime of experience and ceaseless vigilance to survive the Yangtze. In order to be safe, you must know the riverbed, the size of the boat, and the water level. And you must know if the boat can go through the channel. If you don't consider all those factors, life will be lost.
ancient Chinese believed the river was controlled by malicious dragons. From commanding temples above the Yangtze, poets wrote tales of lost kingdoms and mighty battles with serpents. But now there's a new dragon, one that pits the raw power of the future against the cultural legacy of the past. Dr. Yu Wei Chao is the former director of the Beijing History Museum. In the Three Gorges area, there are over 1,200 Asian sites, above ground and underground. They have great historical value, especially regarding the Bar race. These were a people who were extremely brave in war, but who loved dancing and singing as well. We hope to understand more about the Bar culture before it gets completely washed away in the flood, so we can share it with the world. This is my dream. As early as the 1950s, archaeologists found traces of an ancient people on the fringe of the Yangtze River Basin. In 1986, they unearthed these extraordinary bronze ritual masks. Created over 3,000 years ago, they provide evidence of a sophisticated Yangtze culture developing simultaneously with its neighbors to the north. Today, the region has been identified as a vital cultural hub, a new unexplored center of civilization. Archaeologists gained a stunning view of Yangtze culture when construction began on the Three Gorges Dam. The entire island of Zhengbao was slated for destruction. Before it was leveled, archaeologists dug a series of trenches. A few feet down, they hit pay dirt. Ba period pottery was everywhere. When the pots were reassembled, their eccentric shapes and abstract decorations revealed an imaginative and enigmatic people. These unusual symbols appear to be a new language, but so far no one has been able to crack the code. Scores of rare Yangtze artifacts are stored in this vault at the Chongqing Art Museum. The security system is so secret, no film crew has ever been allowed inside until now. To conceal the array of sensors, filming was confined to only one angle. Most of these objects have yet to be studied in detail. But one thing is known. The museum's growing collection proves Yangtze artisans were endowed with great skill and vision. Some 2,000 years ago, they created masterworks of porcelain. This Yangtze maiden is a world-class example of elegant simplicity. This ornate belt buckle depicts a rhinoceros, an animal experts say inhabited southern China centuries ago. Gold objects are rare in China. This exquisite bowl is over a thousand years old and almost solid gold. Here, a golden turtle chop. On the bottom, the owner's name, pressed in ink, it was used to stamp important documents. A golden hair brooch, only a few inches long, is a masterpiece of workmanship. All in miniature, it glitters with exotic horses and their riders. On the back, a centuries-old birthday greeting. Bronze chimes may have been used to warn of enemy attacks. The Chinese valued the strength and versatility of bronze above all metals. 
Reassembled here in the Yangtze city of Wuhan is a monumental set of 64 bronze bells unearthed in 1978. Made 2,400 years ago, this amazing instrument weighs almost three tons. The style of the instrument conforms to the fashions of north-central China. The melody is played on the top bells, the accompaniment on the giant bells below. Clearly, the Yangtze people were in contact with cultures hundreds of miles away. Once the Grand Canal was linked up with North China in the medieval period, the Grand Canal and the Yangtze River formed the greatest trading community in the world until the rise of capitalism in the 17th and 18th century. 4,000 years ago, the Egyptians were painting their tombs when the Ba people painted the curious symbols on their ceramics. And Yangtze artisans were already casting bronze weapons when the gladiators first appeared in Rome's Colosseum. To comprehend the potential loss of ancient treasures to the Three Gorges Dam, Professor Yu Wei Chao looked to the west for a comparable disaster. In southern Italy, the ancient city of Pompeii, which was destroyed by a volcano 2,000 years ago, can still be visited, even excavated today. However, the very soil in the Three Gorges area will be scattered and gone once it comes into contact with water from the flooding. It will be gone forever. It is an irreparable loss, and we must do our best to save it. The technique is as old as time, but time is running out at this site called Chungba. Situated on a small island in the middle of a Yangtze tributary, it can only be excavated during the dry season in spring. Strewn with ancient pottery and gravesites, Jungba holds valuable clues to how and when the Yangtze Valley was settled. But to find them, workers must remove hundreds of tons of soil by hand. Funds run out in a few weeks, and by next year, this site may be underwater. It's an archaeological nightmare that haunts the entire Three Gorges area. The cost of building the dam is $28 billion, but less than 1% of the budget will go to saving cultural treasures. In advanced countries, that percentage could be between 3 to 5% of a construction budget. We originally hoped the Three Gorges area, because of its ancient culture and historical importance, would also recover 3 to 5%. While excavators race against time, the white swan sails toward the gorges. For Captain Tan, the river, its rocks and silt-laden waters evoke a more recent history. Beginning in the late 1700s, British traders flooded China with opium. When Chinese leaders attempted to shut the drug trade down, the opium wars exploded on the Yangtze. British gunboats quickly destroyed the Chinese fleet, opening the way for other European traders. The Chinese bitterly resented the invaders, but they made an exception for one man. A young English navigator named Cornell Plant fell in love with the Yangtze and its people. By 1920, he had plotted every turn in the river, his handbook on navigation would save the lives of countless foreign and Chinese sailors.
Just before Jiling, the first of the three gorges, the White Swan passes a unique memorial at the town of Jintan. This obelisk was dedicated to Cornell Plant on his death. It's the only surviving monument to a foreigner on the Yangtze. The inscription was defaced during the Cultural Revolution, but the old people still remember the words. Father of the Upper River. This simple column will vanish, along with the entire town of Jintan, when the dam comes and the flood reaches its ultimate height of 577 feet. Even though the water is still years away, the people have been ordered to tear down their homes and businesses now. Eventually, 1.3 million will be uprooted. Destruction of the buildings will prevent squatters from moving in after the evacuation and minimize navigation hazards after the flood. The population will be relocated to a modern housing complex under construction above the water level line. News in Tan will overlook its submerged former self. Stranded in one of the poorest areas of China, few inhabitants of Jintan can afford even a snapshot of their doomed homes. Events once linked to street corners and courtyards, weddings, births, and deaths, the history of an entire town will slip out of sight like a great photo album lost to a flood. Tan and the White Swan now pass through Jiling Gorge. A 30-mile notch through solid rock, Jiling is the longest of the gorges and notorious for its hidden shoals and rocks. When only 16 years old, Tan first sailed through the gorges as a crewman. On that trip, his boat was dashed to pieces. 17 steamships met their end here between 1900 and 1945. The vessels fell victim to large boulders choking the channel. The deadliest was known seductively as Come to Me. The Yangtze is the wellspring of Chinese mythology. The ancients thought its jagged peaks resembled gods and heavenly guardians. The great beauty of the river lured generations of poets and mystics to the magnificent temples that dot the hills around the Three Gorges. Overlooking the port of Fengdu is a shrine called the City of Ghosts. Dedicated to the god of Hades, it's haunted with Buddhist demons and devils. The endless punishment of human sinners is their mission. According to legend, the tortures that awaited the wicked in hell were reported by inmates who were allowed to return to life. Their horrifying vignettes are housed in a series of temples constructed about 14 centuries ago. The city of ghosts will survive the flood. But the entire port of Fengdu will be sacrificed to the Three Gorges Reservoir. Saving less fortunate temples has become the daunting task of Chinese architects. 
Downriver from Fengdu is the magnificent temple called Shibuze, or Stone Precious Temple. The temple's most breathtaking feature is a towering pagoda. 135 feet high, it is the tallest wooden building in China. Located on a rocky outcrop, the pagoda's internal staircase winds upward for 12 stories. The builders use no nails. The structure was lashed into holes carved into the cliff face. At the summit of the pagoda is a Buddhist temple active until the Cultural Revolution in 1966. To survey the river from the highest story is to look back in time. While the dam will engulf the town below, officials hope to rescue the complex with an ambitious project. This is how the temple appears today. To save it, plans have been drawn to build a massive wall around the base of the pagoda. If the necessary funds can be raised, the temple will become a virtual island within the Three Gorges Reservoir. Eighty miles downriver is another monumental challenge. Zhang Fei Temple commemorates the period between 220 and 265 AD, when three separate states ruled the Yangtze River area. Zhang Fei was a heroic general in the state called Shu. Zhang helped purge the land of corruption, but was ultimately murdered by his treasonous officers. In the 1960s, Mao's Red Guards ransacked some of China's most sacred places. Not only was Zhang Fei's temple threatened, but also its collection of some of the greatest calligraphy of the Yangtze. Such historical treasures suffered damages and destruction during the Cultural Revolution. So to save these cultural relics, intellectuals here wrote Chairman Mao's quotations on the reverse sides. No Red Guard would dare destroy the thoughts of Mao, so the priceless tablets of Zhang Fei Temple survived. This 156-meter line indicates where the water level will lie in just five short years, unless millions of dollars can be raised to rescue the temple from the reservoir. Near the western edge of Jiling Gorge, a song echoes through another treasure of the Yangtze. It laments the passing of the poet Kui Yuan. His works have been compared to a host of western romantic poets, from Shakespeare to William Blake. High above the city of Zigwe, this splendid temple was created in his honor. Standing some 300 feet above the water, it's hard to imagine the rising waters will reach this high, but they will. The strategies to save the Yangtze temples are daring and dramatic, to say the least. Chinese engineers are planning to take the Zhang Fei and Kui Yuan temples apart. Piece by piece, wall by wall, they will be reassembled on a higher ground, a feat that demands extraordinary skill and determination. My own feeling is that the temples, uh, particularly the Zhang Fei Temple and the Chu Yuan Temple, which they do have plans to move, uh, probably are a little bit overly, overly ambitious. Uh, given the logistics of that area, there are no major roads, uh, river traffic is uneven. It'll be very difficult to take apart those temples and then reconstruct them within the time limits that they've set up. Other temples will be lost forever. During periods of drought, the waters of the Yangtze recede low enough to reveal an extraordinary sight. 
This rare archival footage of White Crane Ridge documents a bar of sandstone covered with stylized carvings of fish. The eyes of the fish mark low tide. They were carved in the 8th century over a period of 72 years. Additional inscriptions provide a detailed record of times of drought. A clue to the whims of ancient climate, they span a thousand years. But soon the tide will ebb no more at White Crane Ridge. While his passengers sleep, Captain Tan charts a course from Zigway to their next destination. Upriver from Jiling Gorge is Wu Gorge. 25 miles long, it overlaps the borders of Hubei and Sichuan provinces. By lunchtime, the white swan has tied up just outside the gorge to take on fuel. Further down the pier, a chartered boat has arrived to pick up a package from the past. Excavators from the Jungba site are sending another shipment to the museum in Chongqing. This crate is filled with ceramic artifacts. Over the past week, work at the site has shifted into high gear. There's been a breakthrough in a mystery that has long puzzled archaeologists. None of the pottery at Jungba is the same age. Instead, it spans thousands of years, suggesting the site was continuously occupied. The buildings of one culture were constructed on the ruins of another, making Jungba a layer cake of Yangtze history. This is a major site compared with other sites in the Three Gorges. It can be dated back around 4,500 years through the Neolithic age. The remains here include house foundations, pottery making, cemeteries, trash heaps, tools of production, and tools of daily life. At a makeshift conservation area, an array of rare ceramics are prepared for shipment. Here, fragments of human history span a gulf of time that reaches back to when the Egyptians built their first library in 2500 BC. Multiply this handful of artifacts by 1,200 archaeological sites. Divide by four more digging seasons, and you get an idea of the urgency to save the Yangtze's treasures. Digs like Jungba are often found along the tributaries of the river. None are more breathtaking than the Da Ning. Snaking north from Wushan, it's one of the most unspoiled stretches of water in all of China. The river is a maze of shallow twists and turns. Using bamboo poles to fend off rocks, boatmen and metal-hulled sampans move with caution up and down this 20-mile stretch. Around the bend is the ancient town of Dachang. The region was first settled in the 3rd century AD, but the present town dates back 400 years. Relics of the Ming Dynasty, its buildings are some of the best examples of folk architecture in the Yangtze Valley. The Chinese consider Dachang a national monument. But sadly, none of it will be saved.
The Da Nang also harbors one of the great scenic treasures of the world. Like a miniature version of the mighty Yangtze, three little gorges are packed with imposing rock formations. When the dam is completed, the Da Nang will rise dramatically until its pristine beauty is engulfed under over 500 feet of water. From scenic wonders and ancient sites to treasured temples and ancient towns, the coming flood is a call to action. In November of 1997, at a cost of billions, the course of the Yangtze was diverted to begin construction of a coffer or temporary dam. Boatmen know the river will be safer, but along with the ill-fated artifacts of their culture, they also mourn the loss of their own piece of history. Captain Tan and his generations are living testimony to the triumphs and tragedies of life on the Yangtze. Surveying the shore from his pilot house summons the painful memory of a time when danger lurked around every bend and death was commonplace. Here along the rocky edge of the river, an army of men and boys called trackers lived and died. Until the 1940s, when boats were powered by their own steam, vessels weighing as much as 120 tons were pulled up river by human muscle. The river flowed fast, and the pass was narrow. If you fell, you died. Hitched to lines made of bamboo, straining with bent backs, their fingers almost touched the ground. As they pulled, they sang to ease the pain. Today, a troupe of singers, many former trackers, still perform the songs of their youth. One in 20 boats were destroyed, but no one knows how many trackers were pulled to their deaths. The only monument to their sacrifice, the shore, will vanish with the coming flood. The White Swan enters Wusha Gorge. The most somber and foreboding of the three gorges, its steep walls and spire-like peaks block the sun most of the day. Far down river, the crates of artifacts from the Zhengba archaeological site finally reach Chongqing. Waiting at dockside to protect the treasures are security officers from the Chongqing Museum. The looting of antiquities along the river has become an underground industry since construction began a decade ago. New roads opened the way for the lucrative trade. Peasants and other people in that area are uh, realizing they can grow wealthy from finding these antiquities. Gangs and other groups are uh, uh, involved in this as well. When someone finds something, they're paid off. Very often it winds up in some sort of network that goes either to uh, the south or to north China and then finds its way out of China into Taiwan or other areas, Japan and the west, for example. 
these gangs are very sophisticated. They have up-to-date equipment, cell phones, and other kinds of equipment. They're well-funded, much better funded than the local authorities, the police, and the local preservationists. So that in the race for these antiquities, the people who are getting them out of the country are winning over the people who are trying to keep them in the museums. Thefts from museums are alarmingly on the rise. Nine rare bronzes were recently stolen from the Chuyuan Temple. Works of art belonging to the Zhang Fei Temple have also disappeared. In Fengji, peasants hunting for artifacts assaulted officials who tried to stop them. This rare bronze tree, dating from the first century AD, was allegedly stolen from a city near Three Gorges Dam. It's sold at a New York art gallery for $2.5 million. Security officers throughout the region are in desperate need of funding. Until then, the race to protect the treasures of the Yangtze is a standoff at best. Here at the Chongqing Museum, the Zhongba artifacts are headed for the vault to join the overflowing inventory. Among them, Chinese scholars are finding new clues to the Ba culture. They think this urn-shaped object, called a Chun Yu, was used by the Ba to accompany war chants. It carries the distinctive symbol of the tiger. Some believe the tiger may also link the ancient Ba to a people called the Tu Jia. Today, the Tu Jia live in scattered settlements along the Three Gorges. Recognized as a national minority by the Chinese government, their folk groups still perform traditional dances and songs. Many of their rites celebrate the tiger, the very same icon found on ancient Ba swords and Chunyu drums. Could they be the descendants of the ancient Ba? To find out, a study is underway to trace the ancestry of the Tu Jia. DNA taken from blood samples will be compared with DNA extracted from the bones of the ancient Ba. Archaeologists hope to solve the puzzle of the hanging coffins the mysterious Ba, and the Tu Jia people before the Three Gorges Dam wipes away the pieces. The White Swan now heads for the last of the Three Gorges, Ku Tang. Barely five miles long, it's flanked by steep cliffs and towering peaks. Navigating through the gorge must be done with great care. The Yangtze courses through the narrow channel at speeds up to 20 miles an hour. To warn ships away from hidden rocks, China maintains some 4,000 beacons along the middle and upper river, some in metal boats anchored to the bottom. Passage through the gorges is strictly controlled by a network of signal stations. As Captain Tan enters the rapids, he alerts a station just around the bend. All traffic is halted to allow the White Swan safe passage through the narrows. With flawless timing, Captain Tan executes a treacherous turn against the current. The white swan glides through the gorge with grace to spare. Passengers hardly notice the maneuver. They've fallen under the spell of the mountain soaring 4,000 feet overhead.
A day later, Captain Tan puts in a Chibo's eye. From there, he boards a small boat to a village called Kuchiko. Tan was born here, and his exploits have made him a local hero of sorts. He's come to see friends and relatives and visit the home he grew up in just one more time. The water level has already begun to rise, and his village, like so many others, will completely disappear by 2004. A Chinese poet wrote that a lifetime is like a finely spun thread. The thread that binds Captain Tan to his village and the river below are about to break. Tomorrow, his lifelong adventure will come to a close. At first light, Captain Tan will leave his ship for the last time and retire from the Yangtze. Until a new highway is completed, the river will provide the best pathway to the highly populated Chongqing. During the Second World War, the Japanese took another route. From 1939 until 1941, the city endured 250 major air raids. Bombers came in waves 20 minutes apart. Hundred thousand Chinese died, many suffocated in shelters waiting for the rain of bombs to end. Just outside of Chongqing is a monument that survived the Japanese invasion, but may not endure the Three Gorges Dam. Two thousand years ago, Buddhism flowed into China. A local Yangtze general ordered this statue carved from sandstone. Buddha sat at water's edge to allow boatmen to worship as they drifted past. Today, the shrine remains an active site of prayer. Many fear the dam and the coming flood will claim the statue. But in return, the government promises that by the year 2012, Changqing will be the greatest port in all of China. Hundreds of miles upriver, 40,000 workers, engineers, and specialists are racing to meet the deadline. New cities are rising and a modern highway is under construction to anchor the Yangtze firmly to the 21st century. The hidden costs of progress are high. In one location, 1,000 tombs dating from the Ming Dynasty were destroyed. So far, only a small fraction of the $250 million earmarked for rescue has been released. Government officials are undecided about who should administer the funds. While an army of construction workers rushes to complete the dam, a small but dedicated group of archaeologists continues the struggle to salvage the past. For now, countless treasures of the Yangtze await their fate. Whether the race to save them can still be won, only time will tell. <laughs>